George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Happy birthday, Che Guevara and Donald Trump. Who'd have thought those two would share a birthday? One was murdered by the US deep state. The other one hasn't been yet. Will Donald Trump go to jail? Well, not according to the 12,813 people who've already voted on our poll. Will Trump go to jail? And Friar Tuck roasts Fox News and fries in the deepest of fat the neocon layer that surrounded Donald Trump in his presidency only to turn against him in his hour of need. What will it all mean in the run-up to the election? I predicted, you may recall, here on the mother of all talk shows that Joe Biden would be out before the fall. It was a double entendre to be sure, but now that there are 17 phone calls between Ukrainian business moguls and Joe and Hunter Biden, in which bribery, mass bribery, high crimes and misdemeanors are revealed, even though they've been suppressed by the FBI. Congress is getting ready to withhold the entire salary of the head of the FBI until he releases these tape recordings. It's all going swimmingly in the land of the free. And if you follow the videos, you'll know that Joe Biden is by now quite gaga, but that laughing gas Kamala Harris is so bad, you might wish that Joe could struggle on just a little longer. It's all coming up here tonight on the mother of all talk shows. Stay tuned. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. I celebrate Che Guevara's birthday every year, if for no other reason than it gives me the opportunity to block on social media the usual suspects, the maniacs who have half-digested, half-true stories about the great revolutionist who was an Argentine who fought for the liberation of Cuba, Although he was not Cuban, he was an Argentine and Cuban revolutionary who fought for the liberation of the people of the Congo. Though he was not Congolese, neither was he an African. He was an Argentine, Cuban and Congolese revolutionist who gave his life trying to help liberate the people of Bolivia, who are finally, helpfully and thankfully now liberated. I never celebrate the birthday of Donald Trump, but I'm paying particular attention to it because Joe Biden this week became the very first president in American history to send his chief election rival to jail, to indict him on government orders and to have him indicted and taken to court under arrest as Felon. The game is as clear as can be to almost everyone. Only the most stupid pussy hat could possibly still with a straight face pretend that this prosecution of Trump is anything other than political and not even political but electoral. It is quite clear that Donald Trump has the beating of everyone else in the Republican field and thus would be Joe Biden's chief election rival. We used to call countries that put their opposition leaders in prison banana republics, you know, like 
Pakistan or some of the former Latin American banana republics. That's what the United States has become. Joe Biden has the beating of nobody. Kamala Harris is laughing all the way to the bank because nobody in their right mind imagines that this Alzheimer's patient could possibly be fielded again in 2024 with anyone believing he's capable of serving another four years as the President of the United States. And therefore, Kamala is next in line, unless somebody gets to her also. The Congress has begun articles of impeachment against both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And that might be the Democrats' only hope. Because if Donald Trump would make mincemeat of Joe Biden, just imagine what he would do to laughing gas, who polled 1%, less than 1% of Democratic Party votes when she last ran for president. It's all a tangled web, which is what you weave when first you practice to deceive. The idea that if you can't beat them, jail them, should be the practice of the world's most powerful country, a country deeply involved with 800 foreign bases, with nuclear weapons strewn right across the world, a country of such importance that the question of who is its president is the property of the world. It is a global matter of concern. The state of mental and physical health of the President of the United States, the likelihood that he will be succeeded by Kamala Harris is enough to keep anyone awake at night, either in the garden or out there in the jungle. And people are now paying close attention. Tucker Carlson's not someone whose birthday I would normally celebrate either. Although, like a stop clock, when he's right, he is right twice a day and more, increasingly more than twice a day. Tucker Carlson on Twitter gained 100 million viewers for episode one of his new mini-series on which he's been slapped a subpoena, a cease and desist order from Rupert Murdoch and his children. Whoever will succeed there is a matter that we'll be following closely because like Silvio Berlusconi, the most tangled web is involved in both of their media empires. Tucker Carlson got 100 million views. And in his third episode, which is the most coruscating, the most courageous, the most epic 10-minute broadcast you will ever watch, and you will watch it if you have not yet watched it, then I beg you, implore you to watch it after this show. It is the most brilliant piece of broadcasting that has ever been aired anywhere at any time and I include some of my own greatest hits. Tucker Carlson completely, with laser focus, destroys not just the neocon lair that Donald Trump so foolishly surrounded himself with. He names names. He provides receipts. He doesn't just lay into the transparent maneuver on which the prosecution of Donald Trump depends. He identifies a precise date at which Donald Trump's goose was cooked. And it's a date that will surprise you. It is the day in the Republican presidential debate before he was even the Republican nominee, never mind the victor over Hillary Clinton in 2016. It is the date during those presidential debates when Donald Trump 
accused them, they, and everybody knew who he was talking about the swamp. He accused them, not only of invading and occupying Iraq on a pack of lies, but he accuses them of knowing that it was a pack of lies they were telling, and he accuses the media of deliberately lying to their viewers and their readers in the run-up to the prosecution of and the bloody aftermath of the Iraq war. And Tucker Carlson is right, because you can get away with many things in American politics, in British politics too, but you cannot get away with going to the heart of the foreign policy crimes of the United States, and for that matter, the United Kingdom. Ask Jeremy Corbyn. You can argue about tuppence on the income tax or off it. You can argue about what color to paint the walls in the corridors of power. You can argue about which shoe left or right to put on first, but you cannot expose the lies the mutual bipartisan lies that have led the United States and Great Britain into one disastrous foreign policy disaster after another, costing the lives of millions, costing the expenditure of trillions, costing the infrastructure crumbling everywhere you go in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and indeed in almost all of the NATO countries. Because that breaks the ultimate taboo, which is this, that what we call a democracy is in fact a one-party state. Sure, there's a rubber stamp parliament. Sure, there's a pretend opposition. Sure, there's synthetic fire and fury between them before they slip off to the bar together to enjoy a gin and tonic on the terrace of the House of Commons and no doubt the same in the American Congress too. Because they are divided on the things that matter least, on the things that matter most. They speak and act as one, Republican and Democrat, Conservative and Labour. They are two cheeks of the same arse or ass to translate it to that country to which we are closely related but divided by a common language. Two cheeks of the same ass. And we know what comes out from in between them. And that is the political crisis that we now face, crystallized in Britain over the last few days. I've made clear, I made it clear on Sunday night in this very chair, my feelings about Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson should be on trial, but not for having birthday cake during a COVID lockdown that was broken by everybody, it turns out, including the people that put Boris Johnson on trial and effectively kicked him out of the parliament to which he was elected. Not just elected as a member of parliament, bad enough, but kicked him out of office when he had won a general election with 14 million votes and an 80-seat parliamentary majority. I said at the time, I say it again now, this was a coup. This was a coup emerging from the same deep, dark swamp that subsumed, consumed Donald Trump also. The deep swamp of the civil service, the bureaucracy, the deep state, the dark swamp of the one-party state to which I refer. The deep swamp of the corporate media absolutely controlled and in enthralled in equal measure to the political class that they serve, echo, and help.
to guide. Boris Johnson's crime was Brexit. None of these great organs of state could stomach the fact that the British people had voted to leave the European Union. A fat lot of good it's gone because we are no better off now under Brexit than we were before it. In fact, we seem to be closer to the European Union now than we have ever been marching in lockstep towards cataclysm and disaster in the war in Ukraine. Speaking of which, the Germans will not immediately be able to replace the panzers that are now burning on the steppe at the hands of Russian forces. But they will replace them by the end of the year. If that's not a signal to Moscow to get this whole thing wrapped up before the end of the year, I'd say you should have seen it coming because NATO has doubled down despite what people speculate, despite the attempt to blame Ukraine for blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, as Seymour Hersh said on my show on Sunday, the dogs in the street know that the Americans blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. But as video re-released today shows, little soldier Schultz was in on it from the beginning. He said so in German, which I can now speak a little, thanks to the launch of our Moats of Deutsch. We will do it together, said little soldier Schultz, when Joe Biden said that if Russia invades Ukraine, we will deal with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Schultz said we will do it together. And indeed, they did. Schultz committed a crime not just against the German people, but against the consumers of cheap and reliable gas all over the European continent. He sent inflation into orbit. He left people cold in their homes. He caused the dismantling of whole factories, machinery and all, and their shipping off to the United States. He plunged Germany into recession. Germany is the most important economy in Europe. And when Germany catches pneumonia, the rest of the European Union begins to die. But he committed a crime against the environment, which oddly has not been commented on once. Google it and see, not once, by little Greta Thunberg. I did it the other day because I couldn't believe that it could possibly be true. But Google Greta Thunberg's statements on the blowing up of the Nord Stream 2 and you will find nothing as clear a sign as you could wish for about the true nature of the eco-warriors and the XR rebellion and all the net zero zealots and who they really are, who they really are working for. But it also speaks volumes about the politicians who at COP after COP after COP in city after city after city have been literally in tears about the dangers to our environment by the release of gases from the farting of cows. But I have nothing to say about the release into the atmosphere of the greatest leak of methane, a deadly gas many times more deadly than CO2, they have nothing to say about it. Indeed, they collaborated. The United States, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Britain, all of them collaborated in this great act of eco-terrorism, an act of terrorism even more profound in its global implications than that which attacked the Twin Towers and elsewhere on 9-11-2001 in the United States. That crime that Schultz and Biden committed 
should have been recalled today when Joe Biden, reading for once quite clearly from the auto cue, or is it his earpiece, said that global warming, that climate change was the existential threat to the existence of humanity. No, Joe, it's you. It is you that is the existential threat to the existence of humanity. That's why I hope Donald Trump brings you down. I hope that Tucker Carlson helps him to do so. And by the way, on the principle, if you can't beat them, join them. I'll be doing my own Galloway on Twitter coming very soon. But stay tuned because for the next one hour and 40 minutes, it is the mother of all talk shows. Let me uh, say that you can listen to the audio only version of Moats on our Moats podcast and the numbers on that are going through the roof. Just search Moats with George Galloway on Apple, Spotify, Google, or whichever platform you listen to your podcasts on. In recent weeks, it's been the number one political podcast in Benin, Jordan, the Gambia, Qatar, Jamaica, Ghana, Iceland, Malaysia, Singapore, Sweden, and the Philippines. Number one political podcast in all those countries. Truly, truly phenomenal. Do you know that BBC News has lost 40% of its audience in the last two years. It's official. And of course, that is the sensible thing to do. But to get people to tune in and change course and listen to a radically different point of view is even more difficult. But it's happening. And the numbers that we are racking up are now in their millions. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Here are the numbers to call if you'd like to comment on anything I've said or didn't say, but should have if you're in the UK and Ireland. It's 0808196552. If you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the rest of the world, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. So spread the numbers around, get your calls in early. I expect to be busy tonight. Not least because of the poll, which is currently standing at 13,413 votes, and the show is only 23 minutes old. Will Trump go to jail? You can vote on my Twitter, on YouTube, if you're watching now on YouTube, on Telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway, or on the YouTube community poll, where a staggering number of people have already voted. And most of you don't believe that Donald Trump is going to jail. If you think otherwise, you better get your vote in now. I scarcely need to give an introduction to our first guest this evening because he has proved to be one of the most watched, the most successful guests on the mother of all talk shows. He's based in what we, from an Orientalist standpoint, call the Far East. No one ever quite explained far from where and why, but he has a purview of the whole world and he knows about war and he knows about the new atlas which is emerging. He is, of course, former soldier and all-round sage, Brian Belatic. Brian, welcome back uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Lots of military news to discuss this evening. I hope you'll uh, forgive me. Uh, I'm much uh, taken, as many people are, by the sights and sounds of German panzers burning on the steppe, American Bradleys on fire on the steppe, uh, Canadian military vehicles breaking down on the road to the battlefield. It isn't going so well for NATO, this so-called counteroffensive, is it? 
No, it isn't. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Uh, so many people have predicted this. Everyone has been saying for months now, I mean, we have been talking about this for months, uh, how NATO's plan of gifting Ukraine another army after they spent their, their previous military on the, the fall offenses of last year, they were sending a hodgepodge of equipment that Ukrainian soldiers have never used before. It's not compatible with the other equipment that they were using, it used all different types of ammunition, had different logistics, training and maintenance requirements. Uh, didn't get nearly enough training. People don't understand that uh, incorporating a new weapon system into a military force usually takes years, not, not a few months. But this is what NATO tried to achieve ahead of this offensive. And now they've launched it. And all, all during the last six months, Russia was not idle. They mobilized 300,000 additional troops to the 200,000 they started the special military operation with. And they dug uh, in layers and layers of fortifications. This offensive is in its second week right now. And they still have not penetrated the security zone which is the space between Ukrainian and Russian-held territory where Russia is mounting a mobile defense. And this is before Ukrainian forces have even reached the first uh, Russian actual defensive line. There's some speculation, Brian, that uh, there are deep divisions at the top of the Ukrainian leadership over the wisdom of this uh, new counteroffensive. Uh, Zalzuni, the defense minister, appears to have literally disappeared. Uh, he's not in any pictures. He's not in any video. He's not making any phone calls. In fact, uh, the president, Zelensky himself, spoke with the head of the U.S. military on the phone today. Why would that not be Zalzuni? Budyanov, the, uh, def the head of intelligence in the Ukrainian state, has literally disappeared no longer mentioned, no longer on any pictures. Could these things be connected? It's, it's difficult to say, but surely there must be divisions. Anyone with a military experience, the general staff in, in the Ukrainian military have to know that a full frontal assault on layered Russian defenses with a hodgepodge of equipment that their troops are inexperienced using, they have to know that this is going to incur huge casualties, loss of equipment with minimal gains. And even if they break through, even if they achieve their uh, objectives, when they reach these objectives, their forces will be exhausted and they will need NATO to transfer over another army's worth of equipment and train up another army's worth of manpower. Surely anyone that understands military uh, matters in Ukrainian armed forces at the higher levels of leadership, they, they must know this. And they can't be happy uh, signing off on this and doing this in their name, uh, with their name attached to this uh, in the present and the very real consequences that it'll have. And uh, then in hindsight, when people look back on this as a historical event. Well, the, uh, there must just be a matter of time before uh, something changes then, because uh, from what I can see, uh, these Ukrainian soldiers are uh, fighting bravely. Uh, there's no mass desertion, although there is desertion. Uh, these Ukrainian soldiers are still going to the front, even though many of them have been literally press ganged uh, into the armed forces to do so. But of course, the richest Ukrainians are in Europe right now. They're on the beach, on the deck chair right now. There are millions of Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, including, as I say, almost all of the richest ones, all of the, the plutocrats, uh, all of the moguls, are all long ago uh, deserted, uh, these streets of Ukraine. That doesn't leave all that many to press gang. There must come a point, surely, at which the public turns on their government, or if that is not possible, a group of army officers, uh, perhaps with an eye to the post-war governance of the country, uh, take matters into their own hands, isn't it? 
That's always a possibility, although I, I would say the greatest possibility of all is Ukraine simply uh, running out of equipment and ammunition. NATO is going to be able to supply Ukraine indefinitely with some amount of ammunition and equipment, but the amounts that they need to organize these type of major offensives, uh, the U.S. and Europe, they've exhausted their stockpiles. They're going to be, from this point onward, resorting to what they're able to produce month to month, which, quite frankly, is not a lot. And it's uh, in no way comparable to the amounts of ammunition, equipment, and vehicles that uh, the Russian Federation, its military industrial uh, capacity can can output. So this is, I think, going to be the primary limiting factor to this conflict. I think NATO will be tempted to enter the conflict directly in one way or another, because precisely what you say, the, the manpower, you may, you may physically have large numbers of young men that you can still send to the front. You have to train them. And over time, the amount of experienced manpower that you had uh, to wage war with that diminishes, and that's something you cannot replace in the, the short term or even intermediate term. These, these, are, these soldiers that are dying now, some of them represent years of experience. That is not easy to replace. You cannot replace that by sending some conscripts to Europe or the United States to train for a few weeks and, and come back and go on to the battlefield. What are the forms in which NATO could enter the conflict? They, they cannot do so under their own charter unless they quickly admitted Ukraine into NATO. This would be vetoed at least by Turkey, uh, but possibly by others too. Maybe even France, which is striking uh, a slightly discordant note on EU and NATO policy these days. President Macron's just asked if he can go as a guest to the BRICS conference in South Africa. Uh, so if Ukraine can't join NATO, on what legal basis uh, would NATO be involved in the war? Well, I don't think that NATO could uh, do anything as an organization. What I think would happen instead uh, there would be a coalition of the willing, so to speak, organized uh, to enter into Ukraine. And then there's some argument about uh, in what capacity would they create a buffer zone in Western Ukraine like the U.S. and its allies created in Eastern Syria? Or would they join in the fighting directly? Would the U.S. decide to throw Poland and the Baltic states in uh, directly into the fighting alongside what's left of Ukraine's military up against Russian forces? And Russia created these defense lines. Uh, they mobilized these additional troops, and they've been very conservative with uh, their strategy on the battlefield. And I think the reason they're doing this is because they do anticipate uh, some form of NATO intervention, not NATO officially intervening, uh, but creating some sort of coalition of the willing but and NATO sending at least countries, some willing yeah. states. Well, Poland, yes. uh, yeah, Poland is the most likely uh, candidate for that. Uh, for it's very odd because uh, the Ukrainian fascists in World War II, in the Holocaust, in the East, massacred uh, hundreds of thousands, if not a million or more Poles. Uh, the hatred, ancient hatred, between Poland and Ukraine is palpable. Uh, Poland believes that parts of Ukraine, uh, including the great city of Lvov, belong to it, not to Ukraine. Poland has ambitions as an intermare power between the seas. Um, to what do you ascribe the apparent growing love affair between Kiev and Warsaw? I think the common denominator here is the fact that both nations have a client regime installed into power, reflecting Washington's best interests, not the, the best interests or histories of their respective countries. Uh, so we see Ukraine destroying itself in this proxy war uh, in on behalf of Washington, essentially. There's obviously no interest being served for the Ukrainian people. And likewise for Poland, Ukraine had a very large military force at the beginning of the special military operation in February 2022. Poland is right now in the process of building up 
its military. Uh, they have spent huge amounts of money on military equipment from the United States, from South Korea, but this isn't going to be done for years. And even when it is done, their force will be about the same size as Ukraine's uh, at the beginning of the special military operation. So we're, we're looking at another scenario where a nation is about to destroy itself in the fire of a U.S. proxy war. And that is because the the regime in power in, in both of these nations was put there by the United States in one way or the other and is making decisions that favor the United States at the expense of their respective countries. Are you surprised as a former military man at the poor performance of the German Panzers, the much vaunted Leopard and the Bradley fighting vehicle? Uh, they haven't uh, they haven't lasted well. I'm not surprised at all. As a matter of fact, uh, when they first suggested sending Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, I pointed out that the Leopard 2 has already seen combat in, in modern warfare in northern Syria, used by Turkey. And they were used by troops that were properly trained, spent years integrating the Leopard 2 into Turkish military uh, warfare, the, their way of war. They had combined arms support that Ukraine certainly does not have. They had artillery and air power behind them, and they were still destroyed in northern Syria by irregular militant forces, terrorists, uh, the Kurdish fighters, uh, ISIS, all of these militant groups using anti-tank weapons, uh, missiles. And I said at the time that when they go up against Russian forces, they are going to be going up against troops better trained, better equipped with all of these anti-tank weapons and, and much more. And they would be going in with far less support than uh, Turkish soldiers had with their Leopard 2s. Those Leopard 2s were destroyed easily in northern Syria. And we can see the predictable uh, outcome of these Leopard 2s now in Ukraine. Uh, finally, Brian, uh, a bit of a change of subject. You mentioned terrorists there. And that's what we normally call uh, the likes of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But I saw a piece by you today about a ghastly terrorist attack in Vietnam in which the United States voices of Asia and their clients in the uh, media market there have never once used the word terrorist. Tell the viewers about that. This was an attack carried out by an ethnic group in Vietnam. This was an ethnic group that actually sided with the U.S. in its war against the Vietnamese people in the 60s and 70s. And they attacked several police stations. I believe there were nine people killed, and it was obviously a terrorist attack. They used uh, war weapons to carry it out. They killed innocent civilians and bystanders. What else could you call it but a terrorist attack? But uh, U.S. government-funded Radio Free Asia... Uh, they wrote an entire article, and from top to bottom, the word terrorism wasn't used once. They even include, uh, right below the headline, uh, something to the effect, well, these people felt oppressed and cheated. And they don't, they don't finish the thought. They allow the reader to finish the thought for, for them. Well, then it's okay, or somehow it's justified. And this is what the U.S. does to sell all of its proxy conflicts, interventions, and terrorist campaigns around the world. This is what they... Uh, this is how they framed the, the Uyghur extremism in uh, Xinjiang, in Western China. It's how they framed the terrorism in Myanmar. It's how they framed the violence here in Thailand, where I'm based. This is a, a very common pattern, and now it's playing out in Vietnam. Well, Uyghurs are 0.1% of the population of China. Uh, the terrorist element amongst them is 1% of that 0.1%. And yet, the entire world has been told about the Uyghur question in China. No one will be told about that terrorist attack and what comes afterwards in Vietnam. Brian Belotic will always platform you to educate us about these matters. Thank you very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows, Brian Belotic of uh, the new Atlas political analyst, former military officer. Will Trump go to jail? A, yes, 17%. B, no, 83%. That's on Twitter. Uh, on uh, YouTube, 
it's yes, 16%, no, 84%. On Telegram, it's yes, 15%, no, 85%. And on the YouTube community poll, it's yes, 11%, no, 86%. Someone call me and explain to me the newfound confidence you all have that they will not send Donald Trump to jail. You can call me on 08081. 9655522. That's uh, free of charge if you're in the UK or Ireland. If you're in the US or Canada, it's equally toll free, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're anywhere else in the world, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Let me take a quick break. I'll be right back. We are led by a conspiracy of liars and killers who are ready to kill every last Ukrainian as long as they can keep the Russian war machine occupied and learn from it, sell weapons to their own side and bring about the destruction of the European Union's own economy. This means we're led by criminals, not fools, but criminals who know the truth, but tell the lies, who are ready to see significant numbers of people die for their lies. Now, this has been true before. It was obviously true in the Iraq war, but it has not been true on such a systematic, concerted basis as we are now experiencing. And the man who said it best said it to the largest television audience ever known on Twitter. Tucker Carlson, which was the biggest audience on Fox News by a country mile, would have spoken it to 3.5 million people on an ordinary weekday. Instead, he spoke it on Elon Musk's Twitter, not sponsored by Pfizer or Big Pharma, or the military-industrial complex not sponsored by any commercial entity. Just Tucker Carlson speaking directly to camera. That's the future of television. Directly, online, like this, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Rumble, on Instagram. Everywhere you can get it is the future of television. Elon Musk paid a lot of money for Twitter, but he has repaid, at least in part, any debt that he had to the rest of us by putting Tucker Carlson in front of what will turn out to be, I hazard a guess, in excess of 100 million people. And he spoke some very important truths. So when you're finished watching the mother of all talk shows, if you have not yet done so, you have to watch Tucker Carlson on Twitter. But stay here meantime, because we've got some cracking guests and of course, your phone calls. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, as you know, I love the whiff of a public meeting, and I'm speaking at one tomorrow night, organized by No to NATO, No to War. But it's focusing on the media, on the role of media in this era of war throughout the world in which we are now living. It's called Media, Journalism and Censorship. And if I may say so, it's got four great speakers. Patrick Henningsen, my old friend, from 21st Century Wire, Kit Clarenberg, the greatest investigative journalist in my island, and Chris Williamson, my former parliamentary colleague of the Socialist Labour Party, and yours truly, speaking in the capacity as the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. Follow us, won't you, on social media. It's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. It's online on YouTube, 
Facebook and Twitter. Don't miss it. It's going to be a cracking meeting of that. I'm perfectly sure. Let's hit the lines. Uh, an old, uh, uh, I don't know, friend or foe. I know I've crossed swords with him before. I've forgotten. Joe in New Jersey. Go ahead, Joe. Hey, hey, George. Hey, uh, power to the people. And God bless Julian Assange. And yeah, yeah, man, I mean, diplomacy and, and dialogue, I think that's important. And I don't think we'd really cross swords, George. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm critical of your coverage of Trump and, you know, the way you play into the Trump plan of, of constantly, constantly and endlessly speaking his name for the benefit of Donald Trump. I mean, anybody who read his book, you know, knows that Donald Trump's goal is to keep his name in the media you know, daily, whether it's good or bad. And, you know, in my opinion... George, yeah, but Joe, seen... it's a bit hard... Uh, Joe, Joe, Joe. It's a bit hard not to talk about him when your president has just had him arrested, his chief election opponent. It's difficult not to talk about him. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. But, um, you know, I, I think they all should be in jail. I think the Bushes, I think uh, Obama, you know, they all should be in jail. You know, permanently, but but on on uh, on Trump, you know, this is a guy who's been an elitist, who's lived a life of privilege his whole life, who's got a you know a, a, a entourage of makeup artists and hairstylists that follows him around and you know combs his hair all day. I would love to see Donald Trump spend thirty days in jail. I'm not saying any more, but thirty days in jail where he had to live with the population. You know, you know, and, and let's not forget what Trump did. He, he stole documents, nuclear secrets from the United ah, States of America. No, nah, Joe, come off it. it. Joe, <laughs> come off it. You come off it. Joe Biden has got thousands of presidential documents. They're in his yeah. garage behind his yeah. little green Corvette. Yes. Yeah, 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 man. Lock him up. Lock him. Lock. That's what I said, George. Lock them all up. Lock them all up, but don't, you know, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> over you know, documents, just let's lock them up over something real, Joe. But I think given documents to Israel, you know, for the benefit, you, you know, I mean, he, he pledged allegiance to Israel before America. He says America is first, that on the charge sheet? Is, is that on the charge sheet? Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, yeah. Given, is he charged you know, with you know, giving they, documents to Israel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way I understand it, yes. The the, the attack plan. Uh, no, well, you're that, understanding that it wrongly. Wrong. You're understanding it. You're understanding it wrongly. That isn't one of the charges. I'm thousands of miles away from you, and I know the charge sheet better than you do. You're just blinded by your hatred of Trump, and I'm not. I, I, I don't hate Trump more than Joe Biden. I hate Joe Biden more than I hate Trump because Joe Biden's in power right now and he's taking us into World War III. Isn't that more important than documents, Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you on that, George. I agree with you on that, George. But there is something else that, that we Wait, may disagree let's, on. Let's quit. Let's, no, let's, uh, no, let's quit while we're ahead because your compatriot in Virginia wants to talk about Tucker Carlson, Yuri in Virginia, is up next. Go ahead, Yuri. George, it's good to be with you again. Um, we talked the first time what I called say? in. I said that I said that the mainstream media is dead, and you made sure to correct me on that. I think maybe I was just a little early to the party. Now that Tucker has gotten so much just, play just in two episodes, he's got them now, yeah. Yeah. Tucker's so killed just, them now, I, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I, <laughs> I just put that out there. But uh, and secondly, about U.S. politics, as far as what your previous guest was saying, I think the biggest issue that you're really trying to get to is the sentiment that people are coming to and have come to before, but we're called conspiracy theories in reference to the shadow government that has been in play and that is made even more clear by the complete buffoonery that is Joe Biden. There's no way for him to actually be presiding over anything. So it's clear someone else is pulling the string. Yeah, I mean, and that's a problem, isn't it? Because he's still got uh, all this time to serve in this term, and he's running for a second term. I, I just don't see how that can possibly be covered up, Yuri. 
Uh, so they've got to get rid of him. And they may get rid of him uh, over, over this uh, bribery and corruption. He seems to be banned to rights over millions and millions of dollars, corruptly received from Ukrainian uh, 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 oligarchs, uh, uh, which may have everything to do with the policy he's followed in Ukraine ever since. Absolutely, and yeah, and that and that really, I think Biden is more of a of a product of the system itself. It's not him in and, in and of itself as an isolated incident. You could probably take nine out of ten of the people up there, maybe outside of maybe uh, Rand Paul and a couple others, and they all have done and colluded into the same thing, particularly when it comes to military industrial complex. Absolutely. And they all end up as multi-millionaires. Uh, take a look at how Nancy Pelosi entered the hallowed halls of the U.S. Congress and how much money she's got now. Thanks, Yuri, in Virginia. Uh, some YouTube comments. Dan Harris says, Tucker has grown. He is a changed man. And Big Basil says, I was disappointed to find out that Tucker doesn't write his own scripts. Do we think he writes his new Twitter show? I think uh, that uh, Tucker Carlson has a team uh, that helps him. Obviously, he has to sign off on the words because he's the one uttering them and they will be attributed to him. What I can promise you is when it's Galloway on Twitter, not only will no one have helped to write what I'm going to say, it won't be written at all. It'll come straight from my heart and my lips to your ear and your eye. I hope you'll tune in for it. And Constance Arendt says, if Americans rise up because someone like Trump goes to jail, it would be so American. Hilarious. Nothing done about Assange, though. I don't think America will rise up for Donald Trump. Uh, I, I think that uh, there are there are fringe elements that uh, might become dangerous. What the uh, really profound impact of all of this is the final and utter discrediting of the US political system and the puppets and puppet masters therein. Back to the lines, Imogen is in Peterborough. Imogen, welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Um, I want to say thank you for such a great show this evening, first. Um, I'm really enjoying listening to it. And secondly, I'd like to say happy birthday to, happy 77th birthday to President Trump. And then the next thing I'd like to say is I have a question. Um, do you think we should keep Ukraine's refugees, because the ones living in Britain, because most of them speak Russian and as the the thing that's going on over there is obviously between Ukraine and Russia. I don't think it would be safe to send them back. What do you think? Well, I, uh, uh, I think that the state that Britain is in, it's not likely that many Ukrainians will want to stay in Britain uh, after the conflict is over. They may want to go somewhere else in Europe. They may want to go back. Uh, I don't know which portion of refugees speak Russian and which speak Ukrainian, but as almost every Ukrainian speaks Russian, uh, that's probably what confuses people. But the people of the east of Ukraine and the south of Ukraine are overwhelmingly Russian people. Uh, they were never a separate people and Ukraine was never a state in the borders uh, that it had prior to February 25, 2022. Uh, this uh, Ukrainian state was created by the Soviet Union and uh, Crimea only became a part of Ukraine, which was a constituent republic of the USSR late one drunken night in 1958. Hitherto, it had always been officially a part of Russia. So uh, I, I don't think, I can't imagine, there's a heat wave on in England at the moment, but it will soon be cold and damp. Our rate of inflation is the worst in the entire European uh, continent. Our wage settlements 
uh, leave everyone 10, 15% worse off than they were last year. Unemployment is growing. Uh, our rulers have no clue what to do about it. Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt, I said, are presiding over an economy now even worse than that presided over by Liz Truss and Quasi Quarteng, if anyone remembers either or both of those. So uh, any Ukrainian, I suppose some may fall in love with a local, but any Ukrainian who wants to stay on in Britain when it's no longer uh, necessary to do so would need their head examined, Imogen. Thank you for that. Scouser Lar uh, on the YouTube says, imagine a world where the United States and Europe would be allied with Germany and Japan and hostile to Russia and China. Imagine saying this in 1946. What a powerful point. Alpaca, my bag, says one step forward, two steps backward, war in a Babylon. And Nuts Bolts rightly points out that several thousands of people are watching now. Hit that thumbs up button to claim your free joyride in a captured UFO. Yeah, do uh, hit the like button. That's very, very important. And subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Both of these acts will help us with our algorithmic problems with big tech. But we will be dealing with the subject of UFOs. And you can laugh if you like. Some of us are no longer laughing quite as hard at the issue of extraterritoriality. Uh, nobody, says poll suggestion, will King Charles find the courage to speak up against the US-UK-NATO diabolical proxy war with Russia? Ah, you're having a laugh. Look, coming up after the break, we'll be looking at British politics with Kevin Marr, a man who used to work in the corridors of power, who knows the minds of the politicians, Labour mainly, but also the Conservatives. We'll be looking at the Boris Johnson saga, at the breaking news that one of Johnson's persecutors is himself guilty of breaking the exact same lockdown rules that he voted to effectively expel Boris Johnson from Parliament for. And I'll be asking Kevin whether or not it's all over for Boris or if he will be back. Uh, so let me give you the phone numbers one last time. Call during this brief break. 08081965522. That's 08081965522. If you're in Britain and Ireland. If you're in the US and Canada, it's plus 18449443344. If you're in the rest of the world, it's plus 442039662625. And do vote on our poll. Will Trump go to jail? Everything might depend on it. I'll be right back. On the line is a rose in Texas. I was at the beginning of a song. On Californication, which is a song. Rose, welcome to the show. Fan of the show, transgender fan of the show. And I wanted to briefly address your monologue from last week on Californication. Because I almost entirely agree with okay. what you said. Trans women athletes taking medals and records, to directing children at nightclubs and even going to elementary schools themselves, not to mention hormone blockers for children as well. The attack on freedom of speech, not only against conservatives, but anyone who doesn't fall in line with the agenda, rainbow flags on NATO military aircraft, which is certainly doing more to cultivate anti-queer sentiment around the world than there already is. All of that makes me sick. So because I don't believe in incest, bestiality, necrophilia, and pedophilia, I'm basically culturally right-wing by today's standards, even though less than five years ago, I'd still be left-wing. So in regards to you and everyone else uh, watching who thinks of me and people like me as the villains right now, you should know that I support the most traditional Muslim, Jewish, Abrahamic believers to be as homophobic and transphobic as they want, because guess what? That's freedom of religion, which is a value we claim to have in the West. Now, my religion, I suppose, is I believe I'm a woman, but guess what? Not everyone has to convert to my religion. 
Otherwise, we basically have a theocracy, only this theocracy is for the ever-evolving LGBTQIA supercalifragilistic expialidocious club. So that's all I wanted to get out of my system. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Rose, if I could put your call in a glass bottle and ship it around the world, I promise you that I would do so. Crystal clear, beautifully expressed, and I wish you every happiness in life. It is exactly what people who are transgender should be saying. And if they were, they would, uh, they would disappoint the liberal zealots who want to use them as a battering ram against the traditional family values of the rest of us. Beautifully expressed, Rose. I'll never forget it. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, to set the scene, particularly for international viewers, uh, Boris Johnson, the erstwhile prime minister of Britain, a disastrous one, no doubt, at least from my political standpoint, and I think from his role in the world politics, a disastrous one, has been expelled from the House of Commons. Uh, he was found guilty of eating birthday cake and sipping wine during a lockdown fiasco, which is now virtually entirely discredited in the country, indeed throughout the world. I saw a poll today on the BBC that said that 25% of the British public don't even believe that COVID was real, believe that it was all a hoax. The number of people who think the whole lockdown uh, was uh, farcical, unnecessary, and deeply damaging will be far, far higher than that. So uh, a group of the not-so-great and not-so-good superannuated members of Parliament with nothing more important to do are appointed to a committee called the Standards and Privileges Committee, which sits in judgment on its uh, fellow parliamentarians. It's usually a sweetheart court, but when the person in front of it, whether it be me once or Boris Johnson, fatally, uh, the uh, sweetheart becomes a kangaroo court. And it turns out now, breaking news, that at least one of the members of that kangaroo court is guilty of exactly that which he used to expel Boris Johnson from Parliament. Now, that's of interest only to those who love Parliament, politics, the arcanity of uh, British parliamentary life. But here's where it gets interesting, because Rishi Sunak, who was elected by no one at all, is in a very precarious situation. The British economy is on the edge of darkness. It is, the guilt price is now worse than it was when that guilt price was used to overthrow Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss. Our economy, our society, whether it's measured on the streets of our great cities, in this heat wave, where 54 people were stabbed in London over the weekend. 54 in the city of London. Uh, whether it's measured by happiness or health of the nation, things are not good. So could Boris Johnson make a comeback? And if he does, will it be before the general election or after it? Well. On these matters, I always take the wise counsel of Kevin Marr, who used to work in Parliament and has learned a lot about politics ever since. Kevin Marr, welcome back to the mother good of evening. all good talk evening, shows. Good to see you again. Uh, I'm good by the grace of God. Is he done for, Boris? Uh, and if so, what happens next? If not, when do you expect him to bounce back? I, I think it's going to be a dead cat bounce. Um, to horribly mix my metaphors, I think in, 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 the, in the Monty Python sense, he's a, he's a dead parrot 
an ex-politician who ceased to be, he's finito. I can't see any any route back. There's technical route back. You can never say never in politics. And Boris Johnson, a bit like Trump, has, has kind of defied um, all the rules all the way through their, their careers. So, you know, it's, perhaps you can never say never. But I think on all conventional wisdom, that's it. You know, Boris Johnson is cashed out of British politics because, um, you know, he's ridden his look for a very long time. And, of course, Boris is very fond of of, of kind of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a classicist, very fond of, 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 of Greek and uh, Latin metaphors. And, you know, he is the proverbial Icarus. He's, he's flown too far to the sun for too long. His wings have become unstuck and he's now crashed into the into the into the, the briny depths. And, and, and I can't see any way back for him. And I think I think you can you can sense that by the reaction to um his his resignation announcement last last Friday, where where you know even people who were among his strongest supporters, people like Grant Shapps, the transport secretary, who you know 18 months ago was was kind of ensconced with Boris in the number 10 bunker, uh, working the numbers on his infamous spreadsheet of, of, of Conservative MPs to see who would, who would back Boris in, an, in any type vote. So, so when, when people like Grant Shapps are pushed out or, or volunteer to go out to put the boot in to say, you know, I'm sorry, Boris, you're off the pitch now, you know, that's it. The game does carry on, but you're no longer a part of it. I think that's that's really significant. If you were advising Boris right now, and and, and I'm sure there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of dark muttering in in, in, a, in a room somewhere. If you were advising him, you would say, you know, there is realistically no way back here for you because your own party is tired of the psychodrama that you bring, um, and and that's it. You know, they, they've moved into a different position. They're trying to in the in the 12 months that they've got left. Of this parliament before there's going to be an election probably next may um you know it's, it's operation patch up the boat um you know they're taking a lot of water on, on a lot of issues as you as you say the economy is in a very perilous position inflation is still very high energy prices um impacts of global events but also also a legacy of 13 years in government you know boris johnson you know you know succeeded theresa may who succeeded david cameron so the conservatives have been in power for a very long time and the, the, there's that sense that everything that's going wrong is has kind of happened on their watch, um, and it's very difficult for a government to renew itself in opposition, in, in, in government rather. It usually happens in opposition, where you take a long, hard look at your record and change things, and then come back. It's very hard to do that in government, but that's that's the challenge for Rishi Sunak um, over the next twelve months. And to be fair, if you had his cards, you wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't be particularly happy either, but I think Boris. I think Boris is is done for. It may have been a psychodrama, but at least it was a drama. Uh, what's happening now <clears throat> under Sunak and Hunt is uh, is a somnolent uh, drift to the rocks, isn't it? Uh, they're not even really trying to avoid the <clears throat> crash that's coming. It may, it may well be. It may well be that you know they, they look back and say, actually, if we could have split the difference somewhere, and we could have had some of uh, you know Boris's charisma and, and and the fact that he you know he did command attention um, for good or ill, but 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 you know he's he's as is often the case in politics, deposed by very grey men, um, and and as you say, those grey men have a huge challenge over the next 12 months and it may be that it's just it's too great for them but you know Rishi Sunak is positioning himself as the antithesis of Boris Johnson he's trying to portray himself as the details man where Boris Johnson was the great sweep of history guy um, who, who didn't really understand how anything worked but but just had the big picture uh, Sunak is the small picture guy who is trying to as I say patch up the boat because they're taking on water on any number of fronts um, you know, you know, literally and metaphorically, literally with the small boats issue um, with with migrants crossing the English Channel right the way through to the big, um, the, you know, the big the big kind of um, economic decisions and questions and the crisis that we've got in so much of, the, of our public uh, public realm and public services in the NHS. And there's some kind of the, the, the fact that over 13 years of austerity has now caught up with local authorities, with schools, with, you know, the, the entire public realm as well. So there's, there's a lot of people very let down, driving along very bumpy roads because we've got huge potholes, um, teaching in schools that are now dilapidated, hospitals that are falling apart. Um, you know, the, the, you know, they've been in power for a long time and that that, that record will start to stick to Sunak. And his, his challenge is, 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 is to try and argue that, 
he's he's on the right tracks. So give him a chance. He's not been there very long. Give him a chance for for a few more years to have a go at fixing that. Now it worked for John Major, of course, after Margaret Thatcher. Um, you know, John Major took over in November 1990. April 1992 went to the country, and 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 you know, John Major already there, a bit of a joke figure. You know, criticised for being you know a, a, a kind of political lightweight, and of course he went on to record the highest number of votes cast for any winning party in British political history. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, that, that was a high watermark for him. The next five years were pretty dreadful. And of course, the Conservatives got booted out in grand style in, in 1997, in, in, in the kind of the Blair years. So, 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 so but it, it may be a trick that Rishi Sunak is looking to replicate, which is to say, look, give me a chance. You know, I, I look earnest. I, I sound earnest. I'm very uncharismatic but I, but I'm, I stay up late at night I read my red boxes I try and make the right decisions and I try and be a reasonable person and it, and that that will be the basis I think on which you'll try and fight the next general election campaign which is as I say the antithesis of Boris who was you know a larger than life character um had lots of flaws lots of lots of lots of you know his flaws went before him but it didn't really seem to ever dent his popularity he you know he had for a while a kind of political alchemy but but as i say you know after a while that's 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 kind of worn off and he joins a long list of british prime ministers who ultimately find themselves out of office having failed on the thing that they were supposed to be great at you know, so if you go back to, to to Winston Churchill in the war, famously the roar of the British people. Well, the first chance the British people had after 1945, after the end of the Second World War, they threw him out in grand style, uh, and they went for the mild and meek um, um, Clement Attlee, which is which maybe maybe how, as I say, Sunak is trying to position himself. Harold Wilson, you know, whip smart economist, couldn't end that sense of economic post-war economic malaise. Um, and he went in that sense. Jim Callaghan, the great trade union guy, goes after the winter of discontent. So that thing that sometimes Anthony Eden, famously, of course, after the Suez debacle of 1956. So, so that thing that they're supposed to be good at sometimes becomes the thing that, that brings them down. So Boris Johnson, you know, 10 years ago as mayor of London, the most popular politician in the land by a country mile, a bit of a clown prince, but likable and, and you know, an, an unusual a character. Uh, he now leaves parliament muttering darkly about forces and, and conspiracies to bring him down when actually you know what's brought him down is 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 you know his his own personal conduct in number 10 and you know these are not wild parties that he was having in number 10 they sound like some of the worst parties anyone's ever organized to be fair exactly. but at a time when people were being ultra cautious and people were being fined for doing things much less then you know boris johnson faces the charge that kills politicians. It's the charge of hypocrisy, of, of of saying one thing and doing another. And eventually that's caught up with him. And that's why he is tonight cast out. And it's his own fault. What about this thesis that I see advanced in certain quarters, uh, that now there is effectively a split in the Conservative Party. Uh, Boris Johnson is very popular in the party. I have no doubt uh, he still commands a majority in the uh, Conservative Party outside and a bigger uh, section of the population, the 17.4 million people that voted for Brexit. Boris is disproportionately popular there, even though he made a cod of, uh, of Brexit. Uh, the um, possibility of a Nigel Farage... Boris Johnson, Lawrence Fox, a kind of new, uh, real conservative, if you like, as opposed to uh, that slightly shady uh, Johnny who's now running things in uh, Downing Street. The, the true blue blood conservatives. Is that a possibility in your view? I, th I think it's, it's, it's interesting because there's a space, there's definitely a space and and you know, Nigel Farage has been very keen to to, to kind of try and uh, offer offer a kind of you know s smelling an opportunity, which is you know what he's been very good at. Um, in, in you know whatever anybody thinks of him, he's been very good at that, s sensing an opportunity, sen sensing a dissatisfaction in the country, and that 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 is that is very very real. Um, no, 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 does that could that be channeled in, into into something? I think I think the thing about leaving the European Union and Brexit was that it, it was it was a goal, it was an objective. 
Um, it was it was therefore realizable as soon as that referendum was promised by David Cameron, who of course thought that that this would never happen and that the the kind of political consensus, the Westminster consensus, the Westminster class would, would rally round and that would that would push out the extremists as the, as, the, as they saw it. And of course, that's not what happened. And of course, you know, I, I've said to people all the way since since 2016 that be careful what you wish for. If there was a second referendum. At any time over the last few years, over over you know returning back to the European Union, it's very likely the result will be exactly the same. I mean, you look at the polling and all this consistently since 2016. You know, it's not there's no dramatic oscillation. There's there's not, it's not there's no buyer's remorse. There's not million tens of millions of people saying, "Oh my God, what a terrible decision we've made. Uh, let let's reverse it." That's not the mood of the country. That's not the mood of the British public. And there is a space, and, and and Farage inches around it, and others inch around it as well, to say, could you create some new political movement? But you, to do that, I think I think you know tactically, you need a project, you need a goal, you need something that you can latch onto. And at the moment, it's not obvious necessarily what that is. Um, you know, the Conservative Party now I is entering the managerial the, things. Yeah, but... I suppose the yeah, it is, uh, and managerial politics uh, has prevailed. But uh, is, there a, is there a hope for insurgent parties? I suspect that there is. You ask for a project, let me give you one. Yeah. Uh, a project which said uh, there'll be no more immigration, uh, there'll be no more boats coming across the channel, uh, there'll be no more wokery and quackery and greenery, uh, there'll be no more Regent Street uh, where the Union flag gets pulled down and replaced by a Pride flag. In fact, Pride might be reduced back to the week it used to be rather than the month it now is. In other words, I'm painting you a culture war uh, mm. project, uh, which, uh, I mean, it would be a bit difficult for Boris to join that because, hey, he's a good time guy. Uh, but uh, he, he could probably, if you'll forgive the pun, swallow that and join uh, a project like that. I suspect I think, there are substantial numbers of votes in that, Kev. I think there would be. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you look at the. If you were to, if you were to say, I mean, I just, I, you know, this is on the back of a back of the proverbial fag packet before before cigarette smoking is completely banned, but 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 on the back of a fag packet, if if you if you were if you were looking to galvanise that space, which is, in some respect, classically right wing, but is also socially right wing in a way that lots of people who lots of working class voters m might think actually I'm quite attracted to this. If you were to say, for example, borrow the tactics of Brexit have a national referendum on an immigration figure that then compelled a government legally to say it can't rise above 30, 40,000 a year. Now, you know, David Cameron sort of said in 2010, I'm going to get immigration down to the tens of thousands. And those kind of guffaws that that was, that was impossible. Now, I mean, you know, we're in Ireland. It clearly isn't impossible if you press down hard enough to, to make it work. Now, potentially, if you were to say, Let's have that as a goal to push for a referendum on a national immigration figure that binded governments to therefore act. If you were to say, arguably, the 2010 Equalities Act, which underpins so much of, of, of what people call wokery or, 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 or you know, the minority rights agenda, if you were to scrap it or repeal it, what would happen then? I mean, you know, there, there are things there that you, you could think, well, if you wanted to pick a fight and, and, and fuel and, and galvanise a culture war between between social conservatives and, and, and in, in the British context, social conservatives does not mean conservative, large C conservative supporters necessarily. It means lots of Labour voters. A third of Labour voters voted for Brexit. Now, there's lots of millions of people who feel completely cut out of the political equation anyway. And, and as Mario Cuomo famously put it, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. If you could find some issues that that, that, that captured that mood and channeled it, then potentially, of course, there is a space. You know, the parliament, the British political system, the British parliamentary system has been very good at freezing out small parties um, because of first past the post and all the rest of it. It's very difficult to, to, to kind of have equal support all over the country and win lots lots and lots of seats. But the the, the phase that we're in with, with social media and the ability to connect people together in very large numbers, very cheaply and very quickly, 
poses all kinds of challenges to that to that system which which you know which in in your you know in your in your instance you you've challenged that system farage has challenged it with ukip it can be done and you do wonder sooner or later with particularly with lots of noise again on the liberal left about pr and, and sort of moving towards pr whether that might be the moment when actually british politics does change fundamentally because a lot of people who are not represented do not feel represented and do feel these cultural issues define their view of the world and if somebody can capture that and give it a project which might be for example as say a referendum on an immigration figure for example then that could be potentially um a moment that that, that that again breaks through because again the managerial politics that we see just sort of says things are impossible and that's not what people want to be told in politics people want mm. to believe that change yeah. is possible you know we've seen that on the left with with the Corbyn surge we've seen that arguably on the right with the Farage surge and even Boris himself so that's you know so, so there is a mood for that um and 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 you know I think people in the mainstream who feel that they are always perpetually in control of the narrative and the, and the, and the control of the, the levers of, of, of the, you know, the machinery, you know, should look at these things and actually be very concerned that, that, that actually if you're not representing the centre of gravity of the British public, that, that then, you know, that is, a, that is a very complacent place to sit, I would, I would suggest. Lastly, Kevin, is it possible that he'll walk away from politics and, I don't know, maybe become as rich as Tony Blair? I, th I think I think he'll start doing some serious writing. Um, I, could, I could you could well see, you know, would would uh, having 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 a long love affair with the Daily Telegraph. Would he? Would he? You know, and it's obviously up for sale. Would a new owner come in and say and say this would be a great way of starting off, making him editor? Um, you know, mm. would, would, would that be attractive to Boris? I suspect he would. He, he's in many respects a journalist first and a, and a politician second. He's like a lot of people that that sometimes come into politics that are big flamboyant characters that are not as interested in the governing of politics. And I think that's that's very much Boris Johnson. He may feel, look, I've been there, I've done that. I'll still be, a, I could still be a huge, significant figure. He'll make a lot of money, I've no doubt, on the speaking circuit. He was making a lot of money before he was, you know, as 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 a, as a junior MP um, do, doing that. So so you know, he won't be short of a bob or two. But it, it's that sense of once you've held these high offices. You know, and and he's still a very you know a relatively young man with a young family, which will keep him younger as well. That he will want to do something else. I've I've no doubt about that whatsoever. He's not going to go away, but he's not going to enter re-enter mm. British politics um, in, in Parliament again. I think that door is now firmly closed. Kevin Marr, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you for joining us again on Pleasure the Mother of All Talk Shows. Much obliged to you. Will Trump go to jail? Well, 16,705 people have voted and overwhelmingly by at least 85% uh, on average across all the platforms, people say, no, he won't. I'm still waiting to hear uh, from people why or how he won't. On YouTube, Ethel Benny says, Kevin Maher is talking nonsense. Boris is very popular with the public. This former useless Labour advisor is talking nonsense. And Berjesk Lotepino says, Why, George, are you spending time on this complete nonsense, there is this Muppet show, while there are much more important issues to be spending your time on? Well, let's see if this appeals to you. One man who is running down the populist track uh, making uh, promises and exposing crimes is Robert Kennedy Jr. He was sailing along, becoming a kind of ideal candidate. He was going to end the wars around the world. He was going to shatter the FBI and the CIA. He was going to erect a statue of Edward Snowden outside Congress, he was going to pardon Julian Assange on his very first day in office. He was his father's son on issues of justice for the poor and the marginal in American society. As a matter of fact, he was overflowing with compassion for everybody in the world except the Palestinians. Here is number one. 
the lesson to RFK Jr. from me. Watch this. Spoiler alert, I would still rather have Robert Kennedy Jr. in the White House than Joe Biden or for that matter Donald Trump. But I cannot allow the calumnies that he uttered about the Arab-Israeli conflict in his interview with Glenn Greenwald yesterday to go unanswered because I have a lot of followers and many of them have long supported the Palestinian cause and they would not understand how I, of all people, with my record going back more than 50 years could possibly support him after he further enunciated his views on the conflict. What he said was multiply false and disturbingly so. It was ignorant, it was shocking, it was utterly wrong. I say ignorant, but that tends to suggest a lack of knowledge, which given he's a man the same age as me, and he's led an intensely political life, his father was a senator, his uncle was the president, it seems unlikely that a lack of knowledge is what lies behind Kennedy's mistakes and worse in the interview with Greenwald last night. First of all, he stated that Israel has never attacked its neighbors. This is so ridiculous that even an Israeli leader would not claim that that was so. Moreover, the territory that he was discussing, the West Bank, is still occupied illegally by Israel against all international law, breaking every one of the Geneva Conventions. How does Kennedy think Israel got the West Bank, if not by attacking its neighbor and seizing their territory? Why is Jordan still in charge of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem if it was not taken from Jordan in the first place? Secondly, he says that Israel never goes into the West Bank deliberately to kill people. Again, not even an Israeli leader would claim that. Ever heard of Shireen Abu Akli, Mr. Kennedy, an American citizen, a renowned broadcaster who was shot down in cold blood while doing her job as a television reporter? Ever heard of Tom Herndall, the British uh, photographer? Ever heard of Rachel Corey, another American citizen, a compatriot of yours? You hope to represent her family as president. These are only three. There are 300, 3,000, maybe 30,000 that have been deliberately shot, many of them killed by Israel in the West Bank and in Gaza. How do you think Gaza is in the state it's in? If it were not for the illegal occupation and then siege, total encirclement, like the, like the Warsaw Ghetto, the biggest outdoor prison camp in the world, as that well-known revolutionist, former conservative Prime Minister David Cameron called it. Kennedy appears not even to recognize the existence of a Palestinian people. Again, a sub-Israeli position, a pre-Oslo position. Even Joe Biden and Donald Trump talk about Palestinians for Kennedy at one point in the interview. It is an Arab who might be better being a dissident in Israel than in any Arab country. Well, I'm certainly not here to speak up for any other Arab country, but no other Arab country has seized and claimed as their own, annexed, annexed illegally, any Palestinian territory. It is Israel that has done that. Israel has illegally annexed Jerusalem. Israel has illegally annexed the Golan Heights. And it is Israel that shoots dissidents, as you put it, down 
if they demand their national rights. The second level of falsehood was this. I don't know if Mr. Kennedy's ever heard of Nelson Mandela, but if he has, he'll know that Mandela has a grandson. He'll know that Mandela's grandson repeatedly denounces Israeli apartheid. Indeed, says the Israeli apartheid is worse than the apartheid against which his grandfather struggled in apartheid South Africa. Amnesty International, just this day, has denounced as apartheid the separate development of the Jewish citizens of Israel and the Palestinian, not Arab, but Palestinian citizens, exactly the same number, by the way, there are as many non-Jewish Palestinians living under Israeli rule as there are Israeli Jews. The difference is the Palestinians living under Israeli rule for more than half a century have no votes and no rights at all. They can't vote for the Knesset. They can't elect anyone to speak up for them in the parliament which rules them. That's called apartheid, Mr. Kennedy. I'm surprised that you didn't know that Palestinians not only have no right to vote in this democracy you speak of, they have no rights at all. They have no right against arbitrary detention. They have no right to a fair trial. They have no right to own property. Their houses are demolished on a regular basis. Just go on YouTube and you can watch it. If they leave the territory, they have no right to return to it. Many of them have been expelled from it. Why do you think there are millions of Palestinians living all over the world? Many of them in America with votes, Mr. Kennedy. Because their parents and grandparents were driven by force from their own houses, off their own land. Now you come from a family that treasures private property, has lots of land. Can you imagine a foreigner arriving from Paris or London or Warsaw and kicking your large family out of its house, off of its land, and then calling them terrorists when they demand to be allowed to return to it? The way you're talking is pre-Oslo language. It's definitely sub-Bill Clinton, it's sub-Joe Biden, it's sub-Donald Trump, it's even sub-most of the opposition parties, politicians, papers like Haaretz, great journalists like uh, Levy on the Haaretz newspaper. What's wrong with you, man? Learn something before you opine about such a sensitive matter. Now, my good friend Garland Nixon pointed out to me that this is a further lesson that anyone running for office in the Democratic or Republican Party has to recite these Zionist tropes. I get that. But I get the distinct feeling that Robert Kennedy Jr. really, really believes them. Well, there you go, Mr. Kennedy. Anyone with a different point of view, of course, is more than welcome to call either tonight or on Sunday because this story will run and run. And who knows, I might have to give him a second lesson. Will Trump go to jail? You can still vote right up to the end of the show on all the platforms. Uh, moving on to Patreon, I'm very, very grateful as always to my patrons. We've got a new Moats legend this evening, John F. Kramer. Many thanks, John, much appreciated. And new patrons, Leslie James Ryan and Mountain Girl. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, uh, Hill 
says, it's all just a pantomime between the elites and vested interests wanting to use the public for their purposes and in which manner they choose. Tony Martin says, I'd say no, but if the elites are desperate enough to start a nuclear war. Uh, Moats legend Graham Briggs White says, to be honest, it's just one big idiot fest and do not trust any of these candidates where anything could happen. Only when they get where they want to be do they show their true colours. RFK is the best in the pack, although I think his policy on Palestine is deranged, unfortunately. My thoughts entirely, Graham. And Lisa Roddy says, I can't see the Bidens wanting to set that kind of precedent. Paul MacDonald says he will survive this attack. Most individuals would have crumpled under this constant pressure. His uncanny ability to rise above all the insanity will see him back in the White House. As always, Gigi, love to your beautiful family. Thank you, Paul. James Burry says, I think for what it's worth, the strength of Trump's following will mean real problems for Biden. Not that he'll understand what's happening. And Jonathan Wood says, I think it's a very low probability. It would make it just too obvious that Trump is being singled out for harsher treatment than Biden and other transgressors. Plus, it would risk giving Trump the opportunity to play the victim. I don't think it will work, but that won't stop desperate fools trying. And James Butler says, Trump is down, but certainly not out. As bad as some people think he is, he and Robert Kennedy and perhaps Mike Pence have been the best people in both parties for a good number of years and definitely know how to frighten the establishment and deep, straight crooks. Now remember to support me. Look for George Galloway on Patreon. That's George Galloway at uh, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Let's go back to the lines. Fundamentals is in South End on Sea and disagrees with me about Trump. That's why he's on next. Go ahead, sir. Hello, Jules. Thanks for taking me, Cool. It's good to hear your voice. Jules, I've been like, you know, for a long time now, I've been watching Trump and, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this to any, anybody that thinks that he's not going to go to jail, I, I, I think they're deluded, Jules. You know, I don't know whether they've just read the previous. Uh, the, the, the the indictment was just come out. I have read it, um, mm. and it, it's it's mm. very damning, George. Now, I'm I'm not biased. Now, I'm, anybody that uses the argument that Biden done this, Clinton done this, or anybody else done that is absolutely they should run out of the park. It's pathetic. It doesn't matter what Biden's done. Yes, they want him. Yes, they're going after him. However, he's caused a lot of this, George. He's done dishonest stuff. He has engaged in espionage. I've said this. He's been talking to people, George. He's thrown away in secrets. Now, you're a British politician. If, if a British politician done this, uh, you know, you would be mad, George. You would go absolutely mental. What has he done? There Tell me. Not... Uh, this, this is new. This is news to me. Tell me uh, what uh, espionage he's engaged in. Right. So he's taken, he's taken classified... Uh, secrets that he had no right in taking. Whether it was the Presidential Records Act, that's okay. There was nothing he had that was worth taking. Everything he took was of military importance and of other countries. Nothing that he took was, was of value of what was going on. He had no need to take it. The second part of that is he's shown it to people and, he's, he, he, you know, um, it, it, there's a tape of what's going to come out uh, of, of him showing people on the golf course. He's lied. He said that he, 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 class, he, he, was un, un, uh, he, he declassified it. You know, the protocol isn't like, you can't just declassify stuff whether you're the president or not. You know, um, the January 6th situation, George, I don't know where, you know, the, the election call, um, mm. you know, all these are wrong, George, what you've done. I listened to, uh, you know, I know the, the three big things. The January 6th, there was, there was a coup going on there, George. The Mark Meadows and, and the lawyers ah, that was come going on, along with... Come on, a coup, a coup. It was a, it was a, bu a bunch of clowns that were heavily infiltrated by the, by the feds uh, and who were going through unlocked doors that had been carefully le left unlocked uh, for them. Guys in buffalo hats and, uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, foolhardiness. 
Uh, you don't, can't call that a coup. That would be a quiet night. That would be a quiet night out down in South End on Sea. The protesters. That was that was the, the the you know the reaction of what was going on. I'm talking about the Mark Meadows stuff and the stuff that was going on. The the stuff that was going on in the hotel um, previous to the January sixth. There was an organised. Uh, situation. He tried everything that he could. He, he, he got fake legislators in there. He, you know, he, he tried hassling uh, states. You know, as the Georgia call. You know, he, you know, he, he tried. He, he tried. If you're going to stand there and say, if anybody's going to stand there and say to me, he had, he didn't try to seize power, then they're not up to date with current affairs. They really ain't because he did not want. Well, to I'll tell you what. Uh, you've had a, good, uh, and I'm sure there are people with. Uh, uh, similar and many with contrary points of view. So let's leave some space uh, for them. Uh, Sinisa is in Montenegro. Very first ever call from Montenegro, I think. But she wants to talk about China. Go ahead, Sinisa. Well, it's not only China. Good evening and thank you very much. Good evening, for sir. Me my, my apologies. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your long standing dedication for supporting uh, countries in the Balkan and actually all the countries that faced bullying from this new imperial bully that is bullying all the world for the last several decades. Uh, Thank you. Actually, I, I wanted to hear your opinion. Uh, as you see situation now, it's a little bit different. Uh, like the power is going down. Like 20 years ago, it was like I could find explanation for NATO to go Middle East and kill hundreds of thousands of people, but because of that, they would have a free gasoline in their own country. It's horrible, but it's, I could understand this, that uh, what are they doing now? I cannot understand because as I see that they're, they're working against themselves, their own people, as I see, and uh, situation with Russia, China, uh, what what's happening in Afghanistan, it's not great, at the least what we can say. Uh, in this situation of decay, what do you think could happen here in Balkan, especially in the Kosovo? I know you pay attention about that. Will they maybe release the pressure from the Serbia, from Kosovo, from Balkan? It in all, or maybe they will use us like you know backup plan because everything goes wrong in Ukraine. Okay, well, let's go on some smaller country and show some uh, victory to the world. Yeah, there's always Please. that. Uh, there's always that danger. Uh, the immediate uh, crisis has passed in that the European Union is now uh, at war with the. Kosovo administration, uh, and that's a significant new development. I suspect that uh, some in the European Union thought that a new war against Serbia and its supporters uh, around Europe and the world would be uh, biting off more than they could uh, chew. But we have to keep a very close eye on it because the danger you identified is very real that uh, facing defeat in the Ukraine, where will they seek a victory, uh, a diversion to distract their public opinion, just like the crisis in Ukraine was itself a distraction from uh, the complete defeat in Afghanistan. Uh, I think that uh, the Chinese were uh, way premature when they said in the 1960s, that the United States was a paper tiger. It's not even a paper tiger now. But as I say, it's an old tiger. Its teeth are falling out, its claws too. And there are newer, younger, more vibrant tigers out there in the woods, and they have the measure of them. Sinisa, Montenegro is a beautiful country. Yours was a beautiful call. Thank you for it. Gladys is in another beautiful country. In Mexico. Go ahead, Gladys. Yes, oh, it's wonderful to speak to you, George. I'm very excited. Thank you. Go ahead, Mom. 
I was there calling about the Palestinian issue. Um, it seems that yeah. the uh, Jewish folks, and I'm from New York originally, I had a lot of Jewish friends. I love the Jewish people, but they seem to have forgotten what happened to them during the Holocaust and those horrible times. And what I feel like it's almost in reverse now. The, the only thing missing is the ovens and the way they're treating the Palestinians, but they don't need ovens. They have military. They have high-tech equipment. So if they have snipers, it's very easy to shoot someone in the head, literally from every, anywhere. And uh, the United States giving them $4 billion in 80 year. They don't need the money, George. They're very high tech. They're very advanced. They're agriculture, their technology, uh, their sponsors, such as the good old Rothschilds. They've got plenty of money. They don't need ours. And yet they still um, are running an open air prison there with the Palestinians, as far as I'm concerned. It just really makes me angry that they have forgotten um, what they've gone through, they've forgotten their roots, they've forgotten the Word of God, which uh, has their... Well, uh, I, I don't think... Uh, yeah, let me stop you. Uh, Gladys, thanks uh, for the call. Just because of the hour, I need to cut you a little bit short. Uh, I think for the first time ever, uh, a majority of people in the United States sympathize with the Palestinians more than they do with Israel. That's the latest polling that I have read. I never thought that that day would come. A majority of Jews in the United States are highly critical of the Netanyahu government. And bear in mind, it's a government in which Netanyahu is the least dream of the people in the government. Again, something I never thought that I could say. So the majority of Jewish people in America and the, the majority of Americans have moved decisively in their a political point of view on the conflict. I'm afraid the problem, Gladys, is not the Jewish people in the United States. It's the fundamentalist Christians, the evangelicals, who are in a big hurry for the rapture. They want to bring about Armageddon. They want to bring about uh, the, the uh, end of times. And it's politicians playing to their lobby that I really don't understand. As to Mr. Kennedy, I am absolutely sure that he has lost himself more votes by this stand he has taken against the Palestinian people than he will gain. I think the people who love Netanyahu are never going to vote for Robert Kennedy because of all his other policy positions. The people who love Netanyahu don't want to see an end to American wars around the world. They don't want to see the CIA and the FBI broken up. They don't want to see Julian Assange pardoned and Snowden memorialized outside the Congress. They don't want to see the other parts of Robert Kennedy Jr.'s program. They'll never vote for him. So it seems to me that Kennedy has pleased Nobody who's going to vote for him and greatly disappointed, if not more, maybe even disillusioned, maybe even fatally, uh, the many people who were lining up to support him. Me, as I said in my spoiler alert, I want to see Robert Kennedy elected because there are, let's face it, there are only three candidates who possibly could. One is Joe Biden. One is Donald Trump, and one is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's not rocket science. These are the only three with a shot at becoming president. Who are you going to back out of that three? Uh, YouTube comments on Joe Biden this hour are flooding in. Hong Luong, someone entertain me for a bit. With a population of 331.9 million, can't the U.S. find anyone apart from Biden and Trump as top perfect candidate for the job. You've got it in one, Hong. The happy little fox says, Joe Boy Biden held talks with his cabinet today. He also spoke to his bookcase and shouted at his desk, LGBTQ+, let's get Biden to quit. That's very clever, very smart little fox. Rafael is in Costa Rica and we're always happy to go there. Go ahead, Raf. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Galloway. It's an honor to be here and to speak to your audience. Uh, I, am, I am very much a friend of the American people. I, 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 I managed to study uh, at the university in the United States. So I'm, I call myself a friend of the American people. I'll, along that line as well, I do, I do call upon them in very much in the same way as Tucker Carlson, and as you have also referred to, uh, 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 about the need for them to recognize that what is happening to Donald Trump, whom I despise a lot, yet what is happening to him is a real threat to their democracy. And in, in whichever way possible, they should rise up. I'd like to point out, and on this I would like to ask you a question. Uh, this, this, the Tucker, uh, Tucker's monologue, to me, has a very cryptic message at minute 13, referring to Kennedy's motorcade. So, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Galloway, do you think it is possible that if Donald Trump continues to be as, as, as popular as he is and continues to drive the majority of the American people to back him up, to get him back in office, something would happen to him? And if so, would then the American people rise up? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, without doubt, uh, the Donald Trump's life uh, could very well be snuffed out. Um, he is a clear and present danger uh, to the swamp, to the deep state, and they have killed before. In fact, killed time without number, killed even their own president, killed even the guy who was going to become the president both of them, with the surname Kennedy. But they killed many others. They killed Martin Luther King. They killed Malcolm X. Uh, they killed many black leaders, labor leaders, leaders of uh, various campaigns. And that's just in America itself. Uh, they have killed political leaders all over the world. I was looking at a video today from what I presume to be the grandson of Patrice Lumumba, the greatest of all African leaders. He was murdered by the United States, by the CIA, behind the back of Jack Kennedy, then the new president of the United Kingdom. They tried hundreds, if not thousands of times, to kill Fidel Castro, not very far from where you're calling from now. They don't hide that. They were ready to blow up an airplane full of American citizens so they could blame it uh, on Fidel Castro and on uh, the uh, Cubans. So could the deep state murder Donald Trump? Yes, of course. And they may well do so. But there, there must come a point at which one more conspiracy, one more atrocity, one more sabotage of the American democratic system, one more blowing up of one more taboo becomes the last one. If you knew which straw was the last straw that would break the camel's back, you wouldn't load that last straw, straw onto the camel's back. So will they do so? I doubt it. They'll try and put them in jail first. And that's what this indictment in Miami is all about. Thank you, Raf, for that call in Costa Rica. Let's go back to London and talk to Fran. Fran, go ahead. Hi, George. Um, another great show as usual. Now, your vote Thank on you. Trump, this was the first one where I really pondered because I thought, of course they'll put him in jail. By hook or by crook, they, they'll bring anyone down that wants to change the status quo, like they've done with Corbyn, Imran Khan. Um, so they're, go they're going to stop him somehow. But I was thinking that all hell would break loose if they put him in jail. But you seem not to think so. Um, I thought they might come No, I think there'll be trouble, Fran. I think there'll be trouble, but I, I don't think the American people are at the stage of civil war. Uh, I don't think they're at the stage of an armed uprising against the heavily militarized state. That's what I meant. There'll be trouble, yeah. of course, 
and that trouble accumulates over time and becomes tinder uh, on a fire next time. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think it had come to that, but it could come to a few protests and riots where they could lock a lot of his supporters up, which would suit their cause. But I think they might do something sneaky, like, um, you know, put a tag on him. I know it sounds outrageous and put him under house arrest. So, he, he, you know, he won't be able to uh, run for an election. But I think by hook or by crook, they'll, they will stop him. Um, but I'm not sure whether jail will be the... Um, the outcome, you seem to think it is, but I, I sincerely hope not, because although... Uh, no, most has, uh, most people, Fran, uh, think not. Most people think not. Uh, if they put him under house arrest, that'll be like Joe Biden's election campaign in 2020. He was under house arrest. He fought his election from his own basement, or at least that's what we were expected to believe was his own basement. And uh, he got over 18 million votes. Ha ha. If you believe that, I've got a bridge here in London that I could sell you. Uh, so not being able to campaign is not of itself fatal to uh, Trump's campaign. But I don't think that they will do that because Donald Trump's campaigning style is such that it would be a terrifying risk to do that. To me, they've got to put him out of the game. They've got to trash his name, diminish his support. And you see, we've even had calls tonight from a man in South End on Sea that was unusually occupied by the matter. They tell you about documents. They tell you it's about espionage. If you're talking to someone like me, they tell you it's about intriguing with Israel. If it's uh, somebody else, it'll be intriguing with Russia. Uh, they are doing everything they can at this point to destroy his credibility, even to get the Republican nomination. And they are seeking to build up his rival, Ron DeSantis. So far, none of that is working, though obviously it is a, a project uh, that is still at work. Uh, so we'll have to keep an eye on the polls. We'll have to keep an eye on developments. Uh, but I have no doubt, I've said it for the last few years, that if necessary, they will terminate Donald Trump with extreme prejudice. So that's it then. Donald Trump is headed for the uh, the uh, calaboose. He is on his way to Sing Sing or Alcatraz or wherever they put people like him these days. And Boris Johnson, who briefly commanded the British political stage, is no more. And if Kevin Marr is correct, we will not see him in the British Parliament again. As someone who supports neither of them, as someone who believes both of them are disastrous for their respective peoples, how do I find myself then in a situation where I hate the people who are bringing them down more than I hate them themselves? There are many reasons. I don't have time to count them all. I hate Joe Biden more than I hate Donald Trump, partly because Joe Biden is actually in power now and dragging us to a catastrophe. But partly because he's supposed to be the Democrat. They're supposed to be the party of the people. They're supposed to be the party of the working class. Donald Trump is a Republican. They're supposed to be the parties of the oligarchs. But actually, the oligarchs now own both of these parties. The fact that they don't wholly own Donald Trump, that makes me hope that if it comes down to it, he defeats Kamala Harris or Joe Biden in the election. And if he does, I'm sure a state of war between him and me will very quickly again establish itself. 
Politics is like that, you see. It's never a choice between good and bad when it comes to elections in the late capitalist states. It's usually a case of bad or worse. And only a fool in an election between bad and worse would choose worse because worse might be fatal, terminal, might bring about the end, not just of all elections, but of all people themselves. And ditto in the United Kingdom. I think we need proportional representation. I think that Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson and Lawrence Fox represent an actual current of political opinion, thought, and voting intention in the United Kingdom. I think it's a bigger current than that represented by Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt. I think that Jeremy Corbyn represents a current in British political opinion. And I think Keir Starmer does too. There's four. I could give you more, including my own. But if there are four political currents, four main political choices, why have we only got two? Why have we got to choose between Tweedledee and Tweedledum, which our current electoral system forces us to do, as Kevin Marr was kind enough to say. I'm actually the only person in the Westminster Parliament that has ever broken it, twice, in two different places. Nigel Farage did it for the European Parliament, but couldn't do it for the Westminster Parliament. We can't wait for a new me. We can't wait for a new Nigel Farage. We can't wait for a new referendum. We need to change the voting system. And we're only going to be able to change the voting system if this next general election turns out to produce a hung parliament. And that in that hung parliament, electoral reform becomes one of the bargaining chips. If we don't get that, we're done for. Britain is done for. It is a sinking ship. And if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris get re-elected, it might well be an exploding, sinking ship. And the explosion might consume us all. I'll be back, God willing, on Sunday at the earlier time of uh, 7 p.m. UK time. But before I go, let me give you an update on the legend that is Norma in Bristol. She's Fag Ash Flo on Twitter, if you would like to send her good wishes. She said earlier this afternoon, I'll be discharged from hospital on Friday, having some help and my sons to stay over a few nights as pain is worse in the night. Slow progress, but hopefully the worst is over, folks. I wish you very well indeed, Norma, and your family, and I hope it's not long before we hear your dulcet voice again on the mother of all talk shows. Now, don't forget also that at 5 p.m. UK time, uh, or Berlin time, rather, 4 p.m. London time, you've got Motes of Deutsch, that's Motes in the German language. And you can watch on catch up with subtitles on my YouTube channel. It's very much worthwhile. You get to hear what the German public thinks, what German political figures think, the kind of Germans and the kind of German political figures who never get on the German television any more than I get on the British. So, at 4 p.m. London time, 5 p.m. Berlin time, Mozart Deutsch. At 7 p.m. London time, it's the mother of all talk shows, Mothership. Please come along and see me again and bring another viewer with you. I'll see you on Twitter quite soon. <laughs>